In this video, we're going to talk about a fundamental concept in Java programming, which is encapsulation. First, let's review methods, and forgive me if, this, if you've seen this before and this sounds redundant. Methods have a signature which makes them unique. The first thing we have is an access specifier or access modifier. Public means this method can be called from any class. Private means the method can only be called internally. And protected is a special case that won't make a whole lot of sense right now. For the time being, it's safe to assume that your method should be public. Later on, we'll get into details on when they should be declared private as well. The return type says when the method is finished, what does it return? We had our two string method that we made earlier, and that returns a string. So if we take a look, you see two string returns a string. Uh, if, if we do have a return type here that's not void, the last, and I'll emphasize last line of the method, must be this uh, return keyword followed by a value. On the other hand, if a method is going to do some work and then doesn't have to return anything, we'll use the return type void. So you see the word public, which is the access modifier, and then void. After that, we have the method name, which is something that you can decide. The conventions for method name, it should be camel case, which is lowercase first word, every word that follows uppercase the first letter. It should not be Pascal case, which is where the first letter of every word, including the first word, is uppercase. So a subtle difference between the two, uh, Pascal case and Camel case. For example, the store where I worked in college, Radio Shack, that's Pascal case. You see the radio, the RN radio is uppercase. Camel case would be like this, Radio Shack, like so, where that first letter is lowercase. So that's typically what we're going to do. Method name will not be all lowercase unless the method name is only one word. The method name definitely won't be all uppercase either. Okay, after that we'll have a parameter list, which is what we're passing into the method. We've seen some examples here, like our setter methods. You see int odometer, int miles per gallon, and double gallons of gas. And you see where we're calling that, we're passing in a double for gallons of gas, an int for miles per gallon and an int for odometer. So what we're passing here absolutely positively must be the same type of the parameter here, okay? And if a parameter is declared here, we must pass the parameter when we call the method. In other words, if I take out this 12.0, you'll see we get a red line because I'm not passing a value in, but the set gallons of gas method is expecting a value of type double. Okay, if I do 12.0, we're back to good. Now, if I put 12.0 in quotes, that's no longer a double, it's a string. That's going to give us a red line as well, because a string is not a double, so the value we're passing in does not match the parameter type that the method wishes to accept. So those things have to match. In intro programming, that's a very common error, uh, someone passing in a string and accepting a double. Or what's even more common is somebody passes in a value to a method call, but the method itself does not have a parameter variable that's available, that's declared to accept that, that type. Okay, now, uh, yes, yeah, some method naming conventions we see here, camel case is good. Methods can have letters and numbers. The first character has to be a letter, cannot be a number. The underscore is permitted in a method name. That's not commonly used, unless you're writing some unit tests, which we're not gonna cover in this lecture. So uh, underscore is not, not frequently used, can be. Uh, all lowercase, Pascal case, uppercase, we know that's not good. Okay, so now we come to this concept called encapsulation. There's a little trick here. If I go to vehicle, watch what happens in driver.java if I say my vehicle dot odometer equals, let's roll back the odometer, let's make it 5,000. I get a red line, okay? And if I mouse over odometer, it says odometer has private access in vehicle. So I go back to vehicle, and instead of making it private, how about I make it public? As soon as I do that, I'm able to directly access and change this odometer variable from another class. But that's considered bad practice. We don't want to do that. Uh, in, I'll go ahead and delete this line. In Java, we have a concept called encapsulation. And what encapsulation means is, if we wish to change a variable's value, we have to do it by calling a setter method. Okay, so set gallons of gas, set miles per gallon, set odometer. If we want to read 
a, uh, a, a value from a, an attribute, we'll, we will call the getter method. So getter method, setter method, that means that all access to this attribute from the outside world has to come through the getter and the setter method. That feels like a little bit of extra work, but remember it was very easy to create those getters and setters. All we have to do is right click and refactor and then say encapsulate fields. And almost all IDEs will support this or some flavor of this. So it's very easy to do. Now, have we really done anything though? Have we really protected our variables? Well, yeah. We could go in here on uh, set gallons of gas. We could make sure this is not set to a negative value because you can't have negative gallons of gas in our model. We can also make sure it's not set to an unusually high value that a modern car would not support. So because this is the only place, line 43 through 45, where we can modify the value of gallons of gas, we can put any kind of protection around this. So uh, let me show an example from nature. This is where I lived back in uh, 2000, around 2002 to about 2010, this mild neighborhood. And it just happened that Google came down and captured my street uh, after a summer when we had a tremendous drought. And if you take a look at these uh, street view pictures, you'll see some trees are green despite having a heavy drought. Some trees, on the other hand, are brown. Uh, essentially, they've died uh, because they lacked water. So take a look and ask yourself if you see any kind of theme that's going on between the trees that survived and the ones that did not. Now, one factor is that uh, a lot of the trees that died are young, which is common. They, they a lot of times will go through a transplant shock. But if you look more closely, you'll notice that the evergreens died and the deciduous trees lived. It was almost universal that summer, 2007, that a lot of evergreen trees died when the deciduous were uh, more able to survive the drought. And why is that? There's something in nature called stomata. Uh, if you take a look at this, it kind of looks like a, a valve. This is a magnified view of a tree's leaf. And what happens if you look, it kind of looks, um, you know, so those are different pictures. If you look, you can see it's kind of puffy. What happens is when the tree has enough water, it fills up these cells with water. And by filling it up, it opens the gate. You see how it looks like an opening there. But when the tree is in a low water state, there's not enough water pressure, or as it's called, turgor pressure, to keep these valves open, and they shut. Okay, now, uh, wh where are these valves located? Well, they're located on trees. Okay, what is the importance of opening and closing the valve? Well, if you look at a tree, you'll see it's green all the way to the very top of the tree. That green, probably no big surprise, is chlorophyll. One of the, well, the elements of chlorophyll are the elements of life, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and one other, magnesium. Uh, so magnesium is the, the important thing that converts our sun's energy to sugar. But how can we get magnesium into chlorophyll all the way to the top of these trees? Magnesium is airborne, so it can't pick it up from the atmosphere. It has to pick up the magnesium from the ground. So how does the magnesium travel up the tree? And think about a very tall tree. How does it travel up the tree? Well, when there's sufficient water, the stomata will open. And when the stomata opens, it lets out water vapor. As it lets out water vapor, that creates a vacuum that pulls up the magnesium from the ground and makes it available to the top of the tree. Okay, now back to my old neighborhood. What's the difference between the evergreen trees and the deciduous trees? Well, think about a pine needle. A pine needle cannot wilt. A pine needle is always in a straight position. It's not something that bends. A deciduous leaf can wilt. The reason why you see trees wilt when they either have too much water or too little water is that wilting means they're removing water from the leaves, which is closing these valves and it takes the tree into a protective state. With a valve closed, it can't release water vapor, and it's conserving the water that it does have within itself. Deciduous trees can do this. Evergreen trees cannot. Evergreen trees have their valves stuck open, where deciduous has the option to close the valve. Okay, and what does that have to do with programming? 
These Gitter and Setter methods are essentially our stomata. They're the valves that we have the opportunity to open or close based on the current state of our internal class. So for example, uh, if I have a gallons of gas that's, that's maybe too low or too high, I can say, well, let's take the example too high. If I have 12 gallons of gas in a 13 gallon tank and I try to add four more, I could do a bit of math in the set gallons of gas class to say, wait a minute, you're trying to overfill me. I'm not going to allow that. I'm going to shut my stomata. I'm going to turn off my valve. Uh, if I have some data that I don't want to be accessible externally, I can shut off the setter method. Again, I can either not have a setter method or I can use some kind of computation in an if test to shut off that setter method. So that's why we use encapsula encapsulation in Java. A side note for my friends who are going to go over to the land of .NET. .NET typically, historically at least, isn't as stringent on the concept of encapsulation. What they will do occasionally in .NET is they will make some kind of alias variables that act as a shortcut for getters and setters. On the same note, on the same note, uh, .NET does not tend to be as stringent on naming conventions for methods. You could use a Pascal case method name, and generally that's acceptable in .NET. It's interesting, if you have a .NET programmer who converts to Java, you can usually tell because their method names are Pascal case. Similarly, uh, similarly a Java programmer who learns .NET, you can usually tell because all the variable name, or all the uh, method names will be camel case instead of Pascal case. So that's encapsulation, and that's why we like to use encapsulation in our Java programs. Thank you.